Hello and good Sabbath to everyone. It's nice to, to see everyone here and also uh, say hello to those who are joining us on the Internet. Thank you for joining us uh, today with services and logging on. <clears throat> the first day after Unleavened Bread, the first Sabbath after the Days of Unleavened Bread, as was mentioned in the sermonette, we enjoyed some great sermons. We also enjoyed some great physical food as well this past uh, week, uh, and then for the luncheon and the things that people brought. Uh, and part of the, the messages that came to us hit us between the eyes, as was mentioned, and also touched our hearts. Yet going forward from this point on, uh, what can we do uh, in order to maintain the momentum that we have, that we started to build up and uh, hit the crescendo yesterday, striving to overcome sin and uh, to stay as close to God as we possibly can, even though we know we're going to be uh, hit by Satan with different temptations, to prevent the backsliding that we know comes uh, and to ch uh, a challenge for us that is worth our focused uh, to be do, do, to do our due diligence, uh, those things that are worth uh, doing as a preventative maintenance kind of a thing. When we hear the term preventative maintenance, what is it that comes to mind? Things like our cars, things we have to do with our cars, maybe yard work, uh, a furnace tune-up, dental work, like a cleaning and, and maybe some uh, repairs. Even medications can be classified that way, like a flu shot or for children, uh, immunization shots, preventative maintenance that way. Some preventative maintenance lists have many different items on them, but a few uh, have just short lists. For example, a coffee maker. A coffee maker needs to be cleaned every so often so it continues to work correctly. For example, if you have a Keurig K machine, uh, if you don't change the water and clean it, clean that reservoir uh, periodically, it will stop working. We found that out the hard way. We didn't do preventative maintenance. We had to go and fix that thing. Um, we cut the grass or we do yard work in order to uh, prevent overgrowth of weeds uh, and the grass. And in some cities, if you don't do that, you could get a citation for overgrowth for not cutting your grass. So that ends up being a preventative maintenance in a different way as well. Short lists that could prevent big problems. Some lists, again, are longer and more involved. One example, of course, would be our cars. I think that comes to our minds often. Uh, the list of items would be checking uh, the fluid levels, uh, things like the water or the coolant, power steering level, that needs to be where it belongs, brake fluid, window washer fluid, and, of course, the gas level. If your gas gauge is broken, you need to maintain some sort of a log so you don't end up running out. That would be a preventative maintenance item as well. Checking the tire pressure, tune-ups, wiper blades, and so on. And, of course, changing the oil. That's very critical, uh, making sure that you have enough oil and it's changed periodically. Even our physical bodies need to have checkups and preventative maintenance. If we don't, what will happen? Well, we'll get sick. We can get weak. And that will actually also affect our attitudes if we don't take care of ourselves. We get, we get sick and our attitude could end up uh, adjusting as well. We need proper sleep. We need proper food, we also need uh, proper exercise and protection from the elements, from the, from the weather, from the hot and the cold and the snow and the rain and so on. Even the sun, we need to protect ourselves from that. As important as these things are, our spiritual life uh, has greater value to us uh, in drawing closer and staying close to God and living as children of God, as Christians, it is more important than the stuff that we have, our spiritual life. A broken car can be fixed or replaced, depending on how bad the breakage is. A broken furnace can also be repaired or replaced if needed. Even our broken bodies can be healed 
and with effort they can get stronger again. If we neglect our spiritual bodies, however, there is no replacing it. Uh, if we commit the unpardonable sin, all hope is lost, isn't it? Uh, what will happen? We will not have eternal life. Just as there are many items on lists to pre for preventive maintenance to cars or servicing a furnace, uh, so there is a lot of items that we could have on a spiritual preventative maintenance list for our spiritual life. There are things that we need to do to prevent disasters, to stay focused, and stay close to God and live the way that we're supposed to live. Today we will look at only two of the many items that can go on this list. And if you're taking notes and you're the type that would like to have a, a, a title, we'll just call this Spiritual Preventative Maintenance. This past week was a great new start for us, uh, examining our life, seeking forgiveness, rededicating ourselves, renewing our covenant with God, and with a dedicated resolve, determining to live our lives as faithful servants focused on the kingdom of God and focused on the way that we're supposed to live and think and act. As hard as we try, we all know that sooner or later, if not already, uh, we will slip up. Just as when we find a piece of unleavened bread hiding somewhere in the, in the refrigerator or a cookie that we somehow missed or even an extra large donut that was hiding in the car that we forgot to throw out, uh, that's somehow hiding from our sight as we deleavened. And you know, we actually somehow get a little bit upset that we missed that because we were dedicated to try and get rid of the leaven out of our lives just as we try to dedicate to get the sin out of our lives as well. Uh, it, it caught us off guard, didn't it? And of course, we're a little bit upset from that. We look for ways to get all the leaven out of our path, out of us this past week and keep it out of us and keep it out of our, our house and keep it out of our car and keep it out of, oops, I purchased a hamburger. That was, I wasn't thinking. Uh, but to keep sin out of our lives as well. We may not call it preventative maintenance. That may not be the term that comes to our mind, but that is precisely what we are trying to accomplish. Doing whatever it takes to maintain a the process to prevent sinning. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to focus on. What things can we put on this list that would help protect us in our spiritual life as we move forward? What would help us maintain our progress? To talk the walk and to walk that talk. They would need to be in the areas of our thoughts. They would need to be in the areas of our words, the things that we say, our deeds, and our attitudes. And in general, it would include things like reading and studying and praying and meditating on God's word and the different concepts that we, we look at. Of all the items that we could place on this list, we are only going to look at two. They would fall under the headings of communication and forgiveness. These two items are also areas that would fall under one specific topic. It's actually a gift and it's a command, and that is love. Communication and forgiveness, those two items fall under the topic of love. This analogy could compare to a car tune-up. Love or loving and the two items of forgiveness, uh, communication, with the spark plugs and the wires. So let's take a look at the, the details briefly of the plugs and the wires that bring our communication and forgiveness in, into uh, a focus. Every car or every truck needs gas or diesel fuel. They also need other things in order to run, but uh, the, these two items, uh, the fuel and the spark to ignite that fuel are needed, the gas and the spark of energy uh, to cause that gas to explode in the cylinder where it's supposed to. Those, those are important items. When the engine is off and we go to turn it on, the battery provides the spark of energy to ignite the engine or that, that fuel in the, in the cylinders. Then as the engine is running, it provides the spark that's needed to keep the engine running. The wires provide a path 
for the electric spark to follow to get to that spark plug and to that cylinder to complete the function. Then the spark uh, plug causes the gas to explode. That's the process. This is not a perfect analogy, but I think uh, it can at least help us visualize the process of uh, the communication. So our first point on this list for spiritual preventative maintenance would be communication. There are several wires uh, to provide spark to all the different plugs in the engine. There could be four, there could be six or more, depending on how many cylinders there are in the engine. Uh, and uh, the wires send the signal to the plugs in a specific order. The first wire then would represent our first point of communication, and I think we all realize that first point should be with God. The rest then, of course, would be communicating with the other plugs or everybody else. So that same focus on the spark plugs with the engine is also a focus for us. The first cylinder, the first point of communication should be with God and then the rest of them with everybody else and all the other things that we need to do. For an engine to work properly, there is also a critical point, and sometimes we laugh at this, it's called an attitude. Uh, have you ever had a car that it didn't matter what you did to that car, it just, it had an attitude. It just wouldn't work right. It didn't matter what we did. We took it to the shop. Oops. We knocked it off the shelf. There's all kinds of things we tried to do. It just didn't have a, a good attitude. It was just a terrible car. And then yet, we would have a car that was, we call it a cream puff. It was perfect. We didn't have to hardly do anything, but it had an attitude like a purring kitten. It was great. We wished the car never wore out, but that, sometimes we have to replace them. It had a great attitude. Our attitude as we communicate is also critical. We all know, folks, that have sour attitudes. And when they talk, it can be a little annoying for us. And un unfortunately, that car didn't know it had a bad attitude. And sometimes people, when they have a sour attitude or their focus isn't quite right, they don't realize that the way they are talking, not necessarily the words or what they're asking for, is off or it comes out in an attitude that is annoying to us, but we notice it. And sometimes that can be very, very difficult. Turn, if you will, to the book of Philippians. So this first point of communication has two aspects to it. First, with God, and second, with each other. Philippians chapter 4. Communicating with God starts with prayer. And we'll look at Philippians 4, uh, verses 6 through 8. Now, I'll read this from the English Standard. Uh, version. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. There are other different uh, versions that bring this out too, and I'd like to read verse 6 uh, from the easy-to-read version. Don't worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need, always giving thanks for what you have. A humble, thankful attitude is vital when we talk to God, when we communicate with God. We can talk about anything that we want to. God already knows what's on our mind. He already knows what's coming. But we can talk to him about it. So we need not to be concerned about holding back. What are some of the things that we can cover? Turn, if you would, to the book of Matthew. God the Father and Jesus Christ want to have a very deep relationship with us, a personal relationship with each and every one of us. We can build this relationship by communicating with God with first, and of course, first through prayer. Prayer, as we know, is talking to God, Matthew chapter 6. For our prayers to be effective, we must focus, concentrate, to be 
fervent in prayer, we must talk to God from the heart. We really can't have fervent prayer if when we're driving to work, we're praying at the same time. That doesn't mean don't ask God for help because we have some great challenges when we get to work, but our concentration and the ferventness of our prayer when we're driving is not going to be quite the same when we are by ourselves uh, doing nothing but praying to God and not being distracted by anything else. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5 uh, We'll start with, and here again, the English Standard Version. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. And before we take a look at that prayer, let's take a look and consider the instructions that we just received before, the, the uh, as we know, the Lord's Prayer. We are being told what to and what not to do as we communicate with God. Pray in secret so we don't appear to men to be self-righteous or to be hypocrites. We need to avoid repetition. Uh, Doing this is vain practice uh, and lacks focus and sincerity. It is not from the heart. Sometimes we, we may wonder, well, how, how do we have these vain repetitions? Uh, the unfortunate thing is so often people will actually teach their children to pray before a meal, and that's not a problem, praying to God before a meal. But when the prayer is the exact same thing over and over and over for years and years and years, there's vain repetition. It's not teaching the children to pray correctly. That is something that we need to be careful of as we're training our children to pray, what that means and how we do that. It needs to be from the heart. The way we communicate with God is important to God, and it should be just as important to us. The attitude that we have is critical. Verse 9 starts the prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In this, Christ is explaining in more detail how we are to approach our communication with God. It's an outline. We've, We've often heard that this is an outline to prayer. It's not only these words specifically. And that, of course, becomes vain repetition as well or it can be. It starts in verse 9 that we are to pray directly to the Father. In verse 10, we acknowledge, uh, we are acknowledging that it is God's kingdom that is to be set up and that His will should be accomplished. We're asking for that. In verse 11, we now can ask for our needs to be taken care of. But it states our needs not my personal needs. Uh, This is important, and it reflects what our attitude is as we talk to God. That's not just self-centered, but it also reaches out to others. That does not mean that we cannot speak to God and ask for his blessings and specific things that we are facing, maybe maybe some trials that we have, some health issues or or things at, uh, at work. But specifically, our... This, this word, our, the aspect is inclusive of all others, not just ourselves, that we are to pray for others and their situations. And this, again, will go back to our first key, which is communicating to God. In verse 12, we pray for God to forgive us our sins. Again, our sins. Yes, for us personally, and we did this this past week, Yet the our aspect is for others as well. 
We look at this, we'll look at this in a little more detail uh, in a moment, but we pray for others that God would forgive them their sins, but there's a, a process in that as well that we would ask God to help those individuals see that what they're doing or saying or some aspect of their life is not correct, it's not pleasing to God, and it may be a sin, and we're asking God to help those individuals as well, not just ourselves, because we're all in this together separately, but we're all in this together. We all are part of the body of Christ. We're not one individual as the body of Christ. We are all a part of that. And in verse 13, we pray for two items. First, that we are kept from being led into temptation. That is, to be kept from succumbing to the temptations. Christ was tempted in all ways that we are, but did not succumb. Sometimes we can think, what do you mean always? He didn't have an iPhone, so he can't be distracted and, and his focus being taken off. It isn't the item. It's the process of being distracted that we could fall into. So the temptation is there to be distracted, but we're asking to be helped to not succumb to those t- temptations, that we would be led to succeed from staying away from it. Secondly... Uh, that we are kept from the evil one. So we're praying to God and asking for his protection so we can stay focused and stay away from those temptations that he sends our way. There is a second part to communication, and that is, of course, listening to God's communicating with us. Uh, To do this, we need to, of course, read God's word, meditate, and be quiet. And there's a reason for that. We need to listen from the heart. When we allow God's truth to fill our minds and guard our emotions, we will, we can and we will, he can and he will influence us and guide all of our thoughts. It will also then help guide all of our words and our conduct and also our attitudes. We receive blessings when we read and meditate on God's word and apply them into our lives, living his way, not the way we think that we should. Because God's ways are not our ways, they are higher and they are eternal. We cannot figure them out on our own and decide what they are going to be. And it's interesting that even some of the world religions today read in the Bible that God said it's okay to have the type of marriages that are being promoted, lesbian and gay and and some of the other things. They actually have verses that they say God says it's okay. They thought of it. That's not what God put into their mind. So it's what what comes from God's word that comes into our mind that we need to follow and what he reveals to us. Our relationship with God the Father and with Jesus Christ will grow closer and more intimate for two reasons. Because first, he chose to reveal himself and his word to us and his ways as we seek him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And second, we chose, because it is our choice, to follow and to obey his instructions from his word and what he has revealed to us. And I say that because when we first, we've heard this before, when we first come into the church, we don't know and understand what we know 20, 30, 40 years later. He reveals to us certain things and so we grow and we grow closer to God and there's a purpose for that. When we live our life grounded in God's truth, our life is full of peace. It is a gift from God. We will grow spiritually and and develop discernment as well. This will guide our choices and it will guard us against Satan's ways and his temptations, his deceptions that he will put in our path and and try and fill our minds with, with that. Because we do demonstrate wisdom as we make that effort, asking God for help in our choices, God will guide us and enable us to impact others as well by our examples and sometimes directly in their lives as they talk to us, maybe ask a question, and we see some wisdom in what they're looking for, and that comes from God. 
We will also, He, God, will also give us greater opportunities and responsibilities to serve Him and to serve each other as well. And you know, it would be wise for us to invest our time and to invest our energy in listening to what God has to say and applying His Word in our life every single day, building them into our lives as a part of our personality and a part of our character. With all this available to us, why would we want our communication to God, with God, to be one way? We wouldn't. All other activities in our day-to-day life strongly, incessantly, relentlessly clamor for our desire, for us to attach ourselves to, to follow, uh, for pleasures. But none of them offers us the spiritual and physical richness that's, that is promised to us by Satan. Satan puts those deceptions in our lives, uh, in front of our paths, and gives us lies, and he, he couches it in such a way that it makes sense, and so we tend to want to go ahead and, and follow him. Our greater, the greatest danger in moving forward we covered this before, is complacency. To borrow a phrase, only you in your life can prevent complacency. Eliminating complacency is preventative maintenance. It takes effort and it's something that we should all do. This, eliminating complacency, is critically important in our lives. The fact is, when we communicate with God or with each other, there is two things that are are required, as we covered. But, you know, talking to God and talking to each other and not listening to God and not listening to each other can become a death now for us. Because communication with God and with, with each other cannot be one way only. Turn, if you will, to the book of 2 Corinthians. Just as we want our car to run at its absolute best, we want our relationship with God to be at its best as well. And we need to communicate with God in order to do that. Second Corinthians chapter 1. And I'll take this one from the easy-to-read version. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father who is full of mercy, the God of all comfort. He comforts us every time we have troubles, so that when others have trouble, we can comfort them with the same comfort God gives us. We share in the many sufferings of Christ, In the same way, much comfort comes to us through Christ. Why? So that when others have trouble, we can comfort them with the same comfort God gives us. There are other reasons as well, but that's very important. We cannot know what others needs are unless we talk to them. Yes, we can talk to others and find out that this individual or that individual somebody is having some kind of a health issue uh, or some other kind of problems. And and that we can find out a little by talking to others. But we really can't find out with more detail unless we talk to the individual. The point is we need to communicate with each other. So when we hear something, maybe giving them a call, going and talking to them and asking them, is there uh, anything I can do to help Um, finding out a little bit more details because it does affect our asking God to help them as well. So this first point of communicating with God and with each other is important as a preventative maintenance activity. Second, the second point of communicating with God, prayer is not for show. It is a private activity. And I'm not talking about if you're over somebody's house for dinner or a meal and you're asked to pray. That's not what we're talking about. Praying to the Father, praying from the heart, and praying for each other. That's what's important. 
first. Our communicating with God by talking to him and listening to him as well as our communicating with, with each other, if you think about it, it really is not a small matter. It is a very important thing. Our second point on this list for spiritual preventative maintenance would be forgiveness. Two parts to forgiveness also. And we just looked at this this past week. The first one, A, asking God for his forgiveness. And part of this process is accepting the forgiveness that God has promised us and gives us. And we did this last week. Secondly, forgiving others. This is a harder challenge for us. After the Lord's Prayer, we find there is an instruction in verses 14 and 15 of Matthew. Let's take a look at that. This instruction and warning from Christ is critical in our relationship with God and with each other. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. And again from the modern King James Version. Matthew 6, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Every translation, again, has a different way of using the words to teach us this point. But they all say the same thing. We need to forgive others of their trespasses. That's what God tells us. If we would do... He will forgive us. But again, it needs to be from the heart, not just words. The point is, if anyone sins against us, if anyone does something wrong that hurts us, trespasses against us, offends us somehow, or we think that they did, they may not have done it. In fact, they may not have realized that they did it, but we hold it against them. So we think they have. In any way, manner, shape, or form, we are to be forgiving to them, just as God was forgiving to us. Let's look at the book of James. This goes back to our first point of communicating with each other. We may think that they did do something that was wrong. They may have, kind of, uh, we need to talk to them. Maybe it was just a misunderstanding. And getting ourselves back on the right track with our relationship with each other is very important. Like I said, sometimes we don't realize that we have offended or sinned against somebody else. We thought we were speaking or doing something good. Sometimes they don't either. It could be a misunderstanding. So it's very important that we go and we talk to each other and stay communicating because then we have a one thing we have is a better understanding of, of each other as well. Christ taught us in James chapter 5 how to pray, and we need to remove all these different traditions that contradict what he taught us, like holding a grudge, never talking to them until they change. We need to be honest with God we, and with them as well, and also with ourselves. Look at, them, look at them in the eye. Sometimes that could be very hard for us to do. But first, talk to God and explain to God. God knows that we need to talk to these people, but we can go to God first and say, I'm having this difficulty. I'm perceiving a difficulty with this individual. I'm going to have a hard time talking to them. Could you please put it in my heart to be able to go to them and talk to them and uh, help us with our relationship? This is important that we talk to God about it first. James chapter 5, verse 16. And I'll take this from the God's Word version. So admit your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. Prayers offered by those who have God's approval are effective. Then in verse 17 and 18, there is an example that is given. In James 5, verse 17. Elijah was a person just like us. He prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Then Elijah prayed and, uh, that the, it would rain, and the rain came down from the sky, and the land grew crops. 
There are other examples throughout the Bible of answered prayers. In each, there is a fact that these individuals communicated with God. It was someone who was living their life in a way that was pleasing to God. And this includes communicating with God and communicating with each other. This includes a humble attitude on our part. We ask God to forgive us. We need to accept his forgiveness. We did this again last week, and we accept his forgiveness. We, change, we are changing our lives. We're trying to change our lives and putting, uh, putting sin as we put leaven out of our lives and our minds as well. That is not beating ourselves down about something that has, has gone on and we're sorrowful about and we're asking forgiveness. It's not bringing up that same thing over and over and over years and years later of something we ask God for forgiveness, but we keep going back and asking again and again. That's not accepting God's forgiveness. That's not moving forward. But we also have to not do it again. We have to pay attention and realize what we did wrong and stay away from it. Maybe being an alcoholic, for example, or something else. Asking God for forgiveness, accepting it, and then moving forward and staying away from those habits that cause us to sin. Remembering to flee whatever it was that caused us uh, to fall short, that held, held us captive to whatever it was we were dealing with. Looking at Second Chronicles chapter 7, moving forward from here, there is a hard thing that we all have to do. It's hard for us to do, to be forgiving to others. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God informs us what we need to do to be forgiving and receive his blessings. This is a very familiar verse to all of us. There's actually a, a hymn and special music that we've uh, had this put to. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. When we are forgiven by God and accept his forgiveness, there is a kind of peace that we receive from God. When we forgive others and do it from the heart, there is also a peace that we receive from God. And, you know, we can't explain it. We can't explain that feeling of peace that we have within us when we accept God's forgiveness and we genuinely forgive others as well. Both items of communicating and forgiveness are covered under one gift that we receive from God through his spirit. The first gift on the list from Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love. That's the first one. And, of course, the rest of them to keep in mind because they're gifts from God and we need to use them. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against, against such things there is no law, but love is the first on this list. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. There is a commandment from God that we are to use this gift, to use all of God's gifts, but to use this gift of love as part of our way of life it is to be obvious in our character and in our personality. An example to others, whether they're in God's body or at work or neighbors or family or anything, it's to be a part of our, the way we live. We know this because the love that you, that we show to others, we cannot do this unless we communicate and we have forgiveness. One spot of all the different places that we find this, of the two most important commandments, is found in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And I'll just read it. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like this. You shall 
Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. When we love someone, we will communicate with them, and we will be forgiven. We're that way with our children. We should be that way with all of God's people. And we should be that way with the public. But we still need to pay attention to what we're doing. In John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, it reads, If we obey what God has told us to do, then we are sure that we know Him. If we say we know God, but do not obey His commands, we are lying. The truth is not in us. But when we obey God's teaching, His love is truly working in us. This is how we know that we are living in Him. If we say we live in God, we must live the way Jesus lived. How do we do that? How do we live the way Jesus lived? Two action steps, and we covered them both already. We communicate with God and with each other, and we accept God's forgiveness, and we forgive others. And both of these items fall under the commandment of love and also the gift that God gave us to be able to love through his Holy Spirit. Remembering that we must have a proper attitude. A bad attitude, as we know, can stop us from receiving blessings and the blessing of eternal life. We need to do this with a passion inside of Willing to give 100% of what we have plus doing whatever must be done uh, to active, actively uh, be desiring the proper outcome. This is spiritual preventative maintenance. It's not all the items on the list, but these are the, are the two that we need to focus on. This may seem over-simplistic in a way, considering that we already do know that we are supposed to be loving and communicate with God and to be forgiving Knowing we live in a time that pulls us away from God, some we have heard we heard yesterday, a Laodicean time, and it is so easy to be complacent in our ways, thinking we are doing good, thinking we are rich, thinking we are being righteous. A Laodicean attitude. This is an attitude that will lead us to death. An attitude of complacency mirrors the mindset of the Laodiceans. Turn to Hebrews, if you would, for a final scripture. When we plan to do preventative maintenance on anything, we take the time to gather all of the items that we need and we actually set a time or a day to complete that process, whether it's a car or a furnace or, or anything else. The spring holy days this past week, Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, was a good time for us to prepare for and then to follow through on. Spiritual preventative maintenance is not a one-time event. It is to be continued going forward, just as you need to put gas in the car every, per- every so often, just as you need to replace the spark plugs, just as you need to have the preventative maintenance to... Replace the tires. Going forward, spiritual preventative maintenance is not to be something that we do only during the days of unleavened bread. Hebrews chapter 10, if you would, for the final scripture. Satan wants us to to be complacent. That's his desire for us. With a couch potato kind of an attitude that follows the mindset of Laodicean. That's the kind of an attitude that Satan pushes towards us. We are to walk by faith, and that means we will be found so doing. We need to focus and to pray, and pray for ourselves and for each other, being sobered about what's going on around us and where we're headed, knowing what God says about this. It is serious to God. It should be just as serious to each and every one of us as well. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful who promised. And let us consider one another to provoke love 
and to do good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more so as you see the day approaching.